Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Christopher Hood, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm based here at the School of Modern Languages um, at Cardiff University. Um, we still have people joining in, um, but it is 10 o'clock in the UK, um, our scheduled start time. So with uh, Shinkansen-like efficiency, we will make a start here. Um, you're not here to listen to me. Um, you're here to listen to today's uh, invited speaker, Dr. Dr. Carolyn Becker, uh, who got her PhD from University of Sheffield. Um, and she's going to be speaking to us today on the topic of kimono and fashion in Japan. Um, can I just point out that uh, throughout the microphones will be muted. If you have any questions, um, please um, put them in the Q&A box and there's a way for them for things to be uh, reviewed and you can also upvote other people's uh, questions. So don't bother using raise hand features or anything like that. As you'll have noted, uh, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so you'll be able to um, review it as well afterwards. Um, so yes, so Dr. Carolyn Becker obtained her PhD from uh, the School of East Asian Studies in Sheffield. Um, her thesis examined diverse uses of kimono in contemporary Japan, and this is obviously going to be the basis for her presentation today. And you can find out much more about her research um, via her um, blog site. Um, the address is there, and I also try to remember to put that in the chat or something later on, so you can get the hyperlink more easily. Um, so without further ado. I will stop sharing and over to you, Carolyn. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and I need to press the... Okay, if Chris, it's all good, yeah? Yep, all looking good. Over to you, yep. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone. And thank you for coming and also... Thank you for Cardiff University for hosting and also the Japanese Foundation for sponsoring the seminar series. Um, I'm Carolyn. Um, I got my PhD from the University of Sheffield. And as Chris introduced, I wrote my thesis on, um, I looked at kimono at the coming of age day in particular. Um, today, I want to talk a bit more general about kimono and fashion in Japan to give you a bit of an overview um, what has been happening. Um, and I put kind of the and up here in the title in brackets because, you know, they, it's kimono fashion, kimono and fashion. They're not two different things. They're very much part of the same um, sphere. So let me, oops. Okay, so just to give you an um, overview, um, how we're going to approach the kimono today. Um, I kind of divided the lecture in four sections. So we're going to start, look a bit at what is a kimono. Um, then we're particularly going to focus on the um, Edo period, which was kind of very flourishing uh, time for the kimono industry. Um, in part three, we're going to look at how kimono as an everyday garment came to be known more as a national costume in the particular in the post-war uh, period. And the last section, we look at kimono fashion now. So what is happening right now in Japan? So what is ki uh, kimono? What is a kimono? Um, so, you know, it's always interesting to look at language because language, I think, can already tell us a lot about certain ideas and concepts. And here I put down some basic uh, vocabulary um, related to kimono. So the first one, of course, the word kimono comes from kirumono, which literally means a thing to wear. So kimono as a thing to wear and if we hear this word, we can think, you know, it could actually be translated just as clothing. But of course, because of historical and uh, the cultural context, kimono came to be known as a certain type of garment rather than just a name for clothing in general. This is also something we will explore in this lecture. But again, I think it's kind of always interesting to look at the word and, you know, kimono could just be regarded as clothing. 
Um, so what are this, you know, thing, this garment we know as kimono, what is kind of characteristic about it? Um, one, I think, of the very characteristic parts that kind of came to be part of fashion vocabulary are the sleeves. You know, kimono sleeves, I think, are regarded worldwide as kind of um, a, quite a big characteristic of a kimono garment. Here you can see on the sides, they come in different lengths, and there's an aspect related to gender, um, gender, age, and also um, formality of the event. But um, yeah, so the sleeves are quite characteristic and can also tell us a lot about the wearer. Um, the color as well, you might have seen it's quite white, and that's also a specific um, characteristic of kimono. And here on the images, you really see like a basic the basic T shape of the kimono. It's also always kind of um, interesting to look at how kimono is made or what is, um, you know, yeah, what are the different parts of it? Because another characteristic of kimono is that it's a quite flat garment. And this is also based on the way how it's constructed. So as you can see, um, Kimono are made from single bolts of cloth and they come in a standardized size. So the size was, st was standardized in the early Edo period. I mean, kind of similar to when you go to a fabric shop in the UK, or um, you get like, you know, a certain size of uh, fabric bolts. And that's the same in Japan. It's kind of related to the, to the size of the um, um, weaving machine. How do you, yeah. So as you can see in the picture here, um, it's kind of related to that. And then, you know, you get a certain size of the, the fabric. And kimono is cut then into, um, you know, several pieces. And these are really the basic of kimono. And what is interesting is that it's largely untailored. So if you know a bit about um, garment construction, a lot of you know, tailoring came became a very important part of European fashion um, in the 18th century. And it's really kind of, you know, kind of emphasizing of the waist. For example, if you have a suit jacket, that's a very complicated garment. It's made of, of a lot of different pieces, which get cuts in different shapes. And what's interesting about kimono is that there's not so much cutting taking place and that it's largely... In the original form, when it's not worn, it's unfitted. Um, some people hence say that kimono kind of disregards the body, but I would argue differently. And I know one of the um, people in the audience, Sheila Cliff, she also talked about this once, that this is actually not true because there is a kind of fitting taking place in the dressing process. But um, we will look at that a bit later. But yeah, what is kind of true is that it's a very flat garment. You can fold it up really easily and there's no darts um, in it to create like a 3D shape inherently. Um, another important part is the obi. You know, we have the, the garment of the um, main garment, the kimono itself. And then there's the obi, it's the white um, sash or, you know, kind of like a belt in the middle of the garment. Here you can see in the picture as well, the woman wearing a quite wide obi. Um, people back in the days, you know, they used different items to tie um, the kimono together. Some people, you know, the lower classes, they just use, use the cord, um, you know, very simple kind of belts. Um, but... The kimono also became wider during the Edo period. I will talk a bit more about this later as well. Um, but just so you know, that's also a kind of very important part of a kimono outfit. Um, the last aspect I'd like to look at is the kitsuke. Let me just pause this. Um, and the kitsuke is kind of the dressing process of a kimono. Now this maybe sounds a bit complicated, you know? Why do you, why is there a name for the dressing? Um, do you need to learn how to dress in kimono? Is it this complicated? 
actually it's not that complicated and this is why I wanted to show you um usually I like to demonstrate this myself but I don't have my kimono with me at the moment so I'm using this video to kind of demonstrate and give you an idea that it's really easy to put on a kimono like a basic kimono can be put on really simply and it's not that complicated um, so here we see the young woman, she is wearing an undergarment. This is kind of underwear for kimono, um, which is usually, you know, quite basic uh, linen fabric or simple cotton and in white. Um, and then the kimono garment gets put um, over it. And there's a bit of an adjustment taking place, which relates to the color. So how much you want to show in the back. Um, and there's one important rule. Um, you know, I always, sometimes people ask me, or people think there's a lot of rules when it comes to kimono. And actually there is not that many, you can do a lot really. It's a garment of fashion. But the one rule is that you have to close the left collar over the right. Um, and this is a rule that came to be established in, back in the Heian period when China, uh, Japan drew a lot of influence from China. And it's really until today, it's really the one thing you should be careful about because basically doing it the other way around is when someone has passed away. And in the, I think the Buddhist or the, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but one of the rituals, they place the corpse in a white kimono and it's the other way around. So it has this connotation of death and afterlife. Um, but then there's really a lot of different play, ways you can play with kimono. Also, how much open you want to have the color up here. Um, I mean, the young, the woman, she's wearing a white um, under color, but there's lots of different ways, uh, lots of different colors. And what you can see here is really that the dressing takes place now, or the fitting of the garment. So she's, of course, adjusting the whole garment to her body. Um, and now it becomes very much, uh, you know, garment that is worn and kind of um, has a very close relationship to the body, more so than you could say garments we know um, in Europe or the States or, you know, with the Western fashion system that has a certain size you have to fit in. But with the kimono, you can really make it fit to your own body. And again, this video has been running for um, just two minutes now, but she's already almost finished. So it's really not that um, complicated to get dressed in a kimono. And I think this really demonstrates um, the close relationship between the garment and the body. As you can see now, she's putting on the OB. There's lots of different ways to tie the OB. Um, this is also what people like to play around with a lot. Because um, as you can see, you can add different colors and kind of show off your OB in different ways. And then usually it gets put to the back, but you know, there's also certain styles where you wear the tie in the front. Yes, so just to kind of demonstrate that it's quite simple process. Um, okay, I need to let's see how I go back. Okay, so we have um, so far kind of looked at what, um, you know, what is a kimono to give you all an idea. And now we want to explore a bit more of the Edo period. So the Edo period was a very interesting period in general in Japanese history. Um, and just to kind of give you a bit of a context, I'm going to keep this short because I'm sure most of you are familiar with this is that the Edo period 1603 to 1868. Um, and there was two important uh, characteristics of this period. So before this period, there was a lot of war. Um, samurai clans basically fought each other to kind of widen their territories and um, 
you know, was a very bloody period. This kind of changed when the Tokugawa clan rose to power and kind of managed to unite all of Japan. And they kind of put in place an isolationist foreign, polit foreign policy called Sakoku, which means that people couldn't go out of Japan and also people couldn't go in. And here you can see one of the only trading posts, um, which was in Nagasaki, the island Dejima, which uh, was a place where Dutch and Chinese merchants could still kind of trade um, some goods, but it was very limited and very restricted. Um, this also meant that, you know, because this um, because of this policy and the unification, the Edo period was a quite peaceful uh, period in Japanese history. Again, for 250 years, this is quite astonishing for this time period, um, which also meant, you know, not people focusing so much on war, but about things they might enjoy. <laughs> well, I mean, some people, I guess, enjoy war, but um, maybe a bit more peaceful activities, which were also related to, um, you know, economic, there was an economic growth. Um, but again, also quite a strict system and a hierarchy in place. So the, um, you know, the shogun, the people on top, they created this hierarchy of people, which was kind of based on the perceived usefulness of certain groups to society. So on top, we have the shogun and the landowners, the samurai, um, following then after. Then uh, still, this was the largest class at this time, um, uh, farmers and, you know, some kind of artists. So they were kind of producing goods, you know, for the benefit of society. So they were quite seen as quite high level. The lowest class or one of the lowest classes were the merchants, though, because they were kind of regarded in a Buddhist sense as not creating something themselves, but kind of just managing. And that wasn't seen as that beneficial at the time. But of course, because of the conditions of Japan, they managed to acquire quite a bit of wealth. Um, so you kind of have a tension here between who is, from the perspective of the shogun, perceived as useful to society and what is actually happening and who's driving culture at this time. And this was also the period where the kimono industry really um, started to um, flourish. So um, I want to look at some kind of, you know, some pictures here, ukiyo-e woodblock prints. They can tell us a lot about society um, at the time. And these are kind of two prints from uh, the series 100 Views of Edo. Some of you might be familiar with them. Um, and here we can see already some um, shopping streets. So these some of the first uh, shopping or commercialized shopping streets in Edo period were in uh, Nihonbashi. This is kind of now the area which is in Tokyo in uh, Ginza. And here you can some see what they looked like at this um, time. And again, this is quite astonishing because you already have a lot of things which are related to commerce and kind of um, sales happening here. So as you can see, for example, the, the shops, the shop front, they all have a certain symbol. And this is actually a logo of a brand. So some, um, some shops started to became known as certain brands and kind of marketed themselves in this way, which was very unusual because, you know, before and still in a lot of Japan in rural areas, you would just go to the local market and, um, you know, have talked to the traders there and get your items this way. But the, here we have like the next step, which is kind of like commercialization. And some of you, you might be able to recognize the logo um, it is a bit hard, uh, difficult, but you can maybe see there's three uh, strokes in the middle of the logo. And this was actually the logo of Echigoya, um, which is now Mitsukoshi. So you can see the, the beginnings of one of the big uh, department stores in Japan still operating today here in the Edo period. And this was quite, quite common 
um, that lots of the big department stores, they started during this time. Here again, you can see um, another kind of shop front with uh, logos, uh, different ones here and some a woman just, you know, going for a stroll and maybe doing some window shopping, really. Um, so kimono shops or drapery stores were a very important part of the business landscape back then. Again, many of the department stores, they actually started as drapery stores. Um, and here we have an interesting uh, photograph actually from, this is a bit later, but kind of to give you an idea what a shop like this looked like. Um, what was quite characteristic as well, that kimono wasn't sold as a sewn and finished garment, but basically you went to a shop and you looked at fabric um, and then it was sewn uh, later. So this, of course, was only available to a certain class, um, you know, again, the people who had money, um, farmers, they would usually sew, um, make their own fabric at home and then sew it. But again, this is kind of what a shop looked like. You have these bolts of cloth and fabric um, with different designs and you can kind of choose um, what you'd like if you even have a bit more money then usually you would just start with the white probably silk fabric and then you would also maybe commission an artist to draw um, an artisan you know to have a more like a picture um, and or request a very specific design these are already designs pre-designed um, Again, here you might be able to spot the logo again of Echigoya on the box um, in the background. Um, a certain sales technique back then was home visits. So um, uh, representatives from um, these drapery shops would also go to clientele, you know, again, those who have money, um, and also kind of show them the latest fabrics, maybe um, some design ideas. What you can see on the floor here is already a design of a kimono maybe this was something the young woman kind of you know envisioned or maybe this is an you know kind of an idea from the salesperson to kind of um, see and discuss what the final design could look like Here, just another um, image, which is also very great um, from the Victoria and Albert Museum. We, again, in the middle, we have um, probably the, um, the owner of the house um, by, with two attendants. On the left, we can see someone hanging um, the kimono, maybe airing them from the, from the day before or kind of making them ready to be put on. Um, and on the right here as well, we have um, a woman, maybe she's also representative from a brand um, showing kind of some kimono fabrics. And you can see they're already, they're quite colorful. Um, so quite um, fashionable, maybe some fashionable new designs that get, get shown here. Mm. As a lot of the basic shape of kimono um, stayed the same, we also can look at Hinagatabon, which are some fashion catalogs. Um, so these were also produced by um, shops and brands at the time to kind of really like a fashion magazine to kind of show off, you know, what um, styles there are, what designs. Um, to inspire customers, to give some ideas, to show off some of the latest trends. There were different trends as well relating to the patterns, um, which also always were related to how wide the obi was, how fashionable it was to wear the obi at the time, because that influences the rest of the design as well. Um, but these were produced in for um, you know, customers, some of them still remain. They're really interesting to look at, of course. Um, 
And this is a great way to find out about designs and yeah, color choices as well. Just here, a bit of a closer look, you can see kind of like a flower design in a basket, which is quite for to they would be quite unusual um for today but probably quite fashionable and maybe a bit of a writing on the left um and some bit geographic which is quite interesting it looks quite modern already um so we looked at kind of the industry side you know who was um who was producing maybe certain trends and the garments, but who were actually the trendsetters of the day. So um, during this time, the um, one of the main places for entertainment were the red light districts in each, mostly in the big urban areas of Edo or Tokyo, Osaka. Um, they had some very famous red light districts. And of course, one of the main participants or one of the main actors in it were courtesans. And courtesans at the time really drove a lot of the trends um, for kimono fashions. Um, again, they kind of were able, the top ones, to accumulate a lot of wealth. Um, and this was also a way for them to show how they're dressed, to show off this wealth, because they could commission kimono from, you know, famous artists, um, famous uh, shops. And as you can see here on the left, uh, the courtesan in the front, she's wearing a lot of layers. And this is, of course, very expensive because the more layers you have to put on, um, the more kimono you have to own and to buy. Um, what we can see here with these two pictures as well, they're kind of 70 years apart, approximately, and you can also see how the style becomes even more affluent and more <laughs> over the top. So this was also a characteristic of the Edo period. As time went on, everything became more lavish, more, you know, more fabric, even more hairpins, everything gets bigger. Um, which is also reflected, of course, in the ukiyo-e style here, but also just from the clothing itself. Um, one characteristic of the style of the courtesans as well was that they wore the obi in the front. They tied it in the front. Um, there's different theories to why this was the case. Um, some people say it's actually easier than to untie it. So if you have, if you are with a customer, they, you can face each other during the undressing um, process. Other people say, I've heard this theory as well, that um, actually married women would um, tie the obi in the front as well. And this was also then symbolizing that the courtesan is married to the customer for the night. Um, so there's different different theories here. Um, and yes, so these these images are very interesting. Also courtesans, again, the obi is often a very important, uh, a very expensive part of a kimono outfit because it's made from thicker fabric, um, brocade, for example. Um, so it's actually oftentimes one of the most expensive parts of a kimono outfit. And courtesans also showed this off by, you know, they kind of started the trend of making them wider and they wore them wider and wider, more fabric, which has to get used. Um, so this was also a trend back then driven by courtesans and which was emulated particularly by the merchant class. Um, the samurai class in general was a bit more conservative um, and they also didn't really like what they were seeing here. The, so they kind of tried to put in rules and restrictions um but these were not always successful but um yeah one of the trendsetters the courtesans and also kabuki actors um very important trendsetters you can see here um the famous actor ichimatsu and he actually became known for wearing the um the checked um print as you can see I think I'm zooming in. Yes, here on the, I think these are part, I don't know if they're part of the sleeves, but you can see the checked pattern, which is still known actually today as Ichimatsu. 
uh, print and this is because of this actor and if you remember the logo from the Tokyo Olympics as well um, they also have this this pattern in them so this again we can see how certain actors came became known to wear certain prints certain designs and um, as you can see here on the left there's another actor and he must be a fan of um, Ichimatsu because it's re he's wearing the the obi and also you can see actually the logo um, of the Ichimatsu he also had a shop um, a kimono shop you can see the logo on the on the kimono as well Okay, I'm a bit um, conscious of time, so I'm gonna, um, I think we're still good, but I also want to leave a lot of room for questions. Um, so I tr will try to hurry up a bit. Um, so we had the Edo period now, you know, great, great period for kimono fashion. Um, lots of interesting things happening. Then of course we have a change in Japanese foreign policy. Um, which in 1868, um, ships from America arrived in Japan and kind of demanded the opening of the country. There was a bit of a, um, a civil war going on then with a fraction saying, oh, we want to open to, you know, the outside. Another fraction saying, oh, we don't want to open. Things are pretty okay. Um, as you may know, the, you know, the kind of more open-minded uh, people, let's say, one um, and we have a different approach to Japanese society and culture and um, this was the beginning of the Meiji period um, Emperor Meiji was placed on top symbolically on top of society and again this was um, also another interesting period in Japanese history because now Japan opened up to, uh, to outside its borders and this again gets visualized through clothing we have two images here. This is both the Meiji Emperor, kind of the picture taken at a similar time. But on the left, we see kind of the image of the Emperor, how he presented himself, himself or was presented also to people in Japan, but also, you know, the States, um, Europe, everywhere in the world. And you can see he's wearing a uniform. I think this is a Prussian um, uh, uniform. So, uh, you know, kind of clothing from the outside coming in. Um, and this was kind of how Japan represented themselves to the world. The image on the other side, it's also interesting because before this time period, the emperor wasn't depicted at all. Um, he wouldn't be seen in images. This was also the first time we actually get some images. And on the left, you have more like the shinto um outfit um which you know also became the state religion of japan so two different images um of the same person and kind of symbolizing two different aspects of um japanese society at this time because you know also this time was again the period a lot of um outside influence came into Japan, which also changed the language quite a bit. And from this time onwards, we have a distinction between things that are wa, which is Japanese clothes, Japanese, or yo, which kind of represents outside of Japan. I put Western here now, but um, you get the idea. So this was new vocabulary that was used for not just clothing, but really a lot of different parts um, of society from food, art. Um, there was a really categorization going on and really a debate in society. And throughout the Meiji period, also Taisho period, there was always a bit of a mixed relationship with um, you know, things Japanese and also things um, foreign. Um, this kind of, you know, looking to the outside, a lot of reformations taking place in the school system, for example, um, economic systems as well. But some people argue that these, um, you know, these were not really changes in Japanese society, but more of a continuation. Because as I showed you earlier in the Edo period, you really already had this great economic system and industry. So 
it wasn't like society completely changed, which is sometimes kind of made out to be, but it's more like a development um, which already had a lot of the groundwork laid in the Edo period. And also, you know, if we look a bit more reflective at these terms, wafuku and yofuku, um, you know, we can say, oh, Japanese clothing and Western clothing, but what does it really mean? Are there different characteristics? I think for me, you could say wafuku is untailored and yofuku is a bit more tailored clothing. But again, also yofuku has, um, there's more untailored garments as well. So it's also, you know, always kind of questioning these distinctions as well. And maybe they're not as clear cut as we sometimes think they are. Here also, um, this just kind of once again to demonstrate a lot of the architecture at this time did change. Um, this is again Nihonbashi, kind of again the, the area for commerce. And you can see a lot of, um, you know, kind of architecture maybe inspired from, from Europe um, or the States. If we zoom in a bit as well, though, you can see still most people wearing kimono or some kind of um, wafuku. There's only one gentleman here who's more in like a suit ensemble, but everyone else still for the most part wears um, kimono. And it does fit quite in. I mean, if you compare the figure with the suit to the man next to him, um, on the right, it's actually not that different, the silhouette. It's a, you know, a suit jacket or a hakama um, or the, the, the jacket and then um, hakama trousers or a suit, um, suit trousers. So again, just to kind of emphasize the point that maybe it wasn't, wasn't too uh, distinct or too separate. And this is also a point I would like to make about uh, clothing um, of the modern girl who was kind of the social figure of the cultural figure of the 1920s, which was also a very interesting period for kimono fashion again, lots of mixing and matching uh, going on, for example, as you can see on the left here. This is um, kind of an outfit, or we see two um, women, one wearing um, hakama style kimono. So this is what came, but which also was the first school uniforms for young women, um, which were based on the men's kimono um, with the hakama trousers, but they wore them as skirts. And on the left, we see, you know, like a young woman in a kind of 1920s, um, let's say, European fashion dress. You can see, though, they're wearing the same shoes. Um, the woman in the kimono, she's wearing tights as well and has like a fashionable handbag. But if you look at the basic shape of both garments, they're actually not that similar. And, you know, some people um, also argue that so... In Europe, um, there was Japanese, you know, the big influence of Japanese art and fashion kimono as well, um, particular in France. And the, this loose style woman wore at this time was actually inspired by the loose shape of kimono. So there's really an exchange going on here and not so much of a separation. And I think here again on the right, you know, a suit a jacket, but, um, you know, there is definitely some similarities with kimono um, as well. Maybe we can have a discussion as well if you have some some thoughts on this. Um, I'd love to hear them. Here also, again, just to uh, to demonstrate some some mit, ma, mit, ma, mixing and matching, um, you know, some women also just wore a, um, like part of a kimono jacket over a dress. So there was lots of really different ways, um, you know, to kind of incorporate the wardrobe and kind of have both, if we want to say they're different, both uh, wafuku and yofuku in your wardrobe and combine them. <laughs> However, there was also a bit of a different influence, um, and this was particularly became stronger after the war. And this was the kind of establishment of, 
kimono academies, which came with a lot of the canonization of kimono knowledge and practice. So, um, you know, some people, um, let's, I don't want to stereotype, but let's, for the sake of the argument, some particularly older men thought that, you know, young people and uh, particularly women, because their clients are only women, lost the knowledge of how to wear a kimono. So they established academies, wrote books um, to kind of try to preserve the way of wearing kimono, maybe not even with the worst intentions, you know, but the problem, of course, here is you kind of formalize a certain way of wearing kimono um, and you kind of preserve just one part of it, which is the most formal and the most um, conservative way of wearing a kimono. And this, um, these academies were very active again in the post-war period, um, which, you know, even today let lead to this image of kimono maybe being a certain way and kind of just there being one way of wearing a kimono, being lots of rules attached to it. Um, and this image of a young woman in particular wearing a kimono to a coming of age day, um, of course, also came to represent Japan. Um, so this is also part of the story of kimono. And a lot of, um, you know, I did interview um, a young woman who went to the coming of age day and wore kimono. And also often them, they do like kimono, but they think there's lots of rules. It's complicated to wear. But of course, they only um, become familiar with this very formal style. Um, but there's also, you know, um, different things again happening. Um so this is kind of the last bit I'm going to look at, um, which in the 1990s, there was this kimono boom, uh, uh, yukata boom, you know, so the light summer kimono. This is by um, the company Yamato. They released this eight colored yukata. Yukata usually are worn into bathing houses and they were usually in the colors blue and white. But uh, Yamato, they kind of promoted this new line of yukata. And this kind of turned into the trend even today, um, you know, in the areas like Kyoto, particularly, or the traditional areas or the historical areas in Tokyo of young women and also men um, kind of, you know, wearing, um, a, 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 let's say, simple uh, kimono or yukata for sightseeing. Um, also, I have to rush a bit now because I really want time for the Q&A. But um, another thing that happens in the 2000, in the early 2000s is this retro boom. So um, one of the influence and influential magazines who pushed this trend was Kimono Hime, which was first is issued in 2001. And this is kind of the first... Um, the first magazine and you can see some of the pictures here and you can really see sense this kind of retro um, influence um, kimono particular popular of the Meiji and the Taisho period a lot of second hand as well you can kind of compare this a bit to you know vintage fashion it there was this kind of there's this nostalgic aspect but also the, kind of the rediscovery of a certain demographic um, for kimono which was often a bit older. So a lot of women in their thirties, maybe who um, are very into fashion. I did interview some of the members of this was I, what I would call a subculture as well. And they're often very interested into fashion, usually didn't find kimono that attractive, but then during this time in their thirties, they kind of rediscover kimono in a way and make it their own. So here, um, you know, part of the what Yuli Wei calls the kimono fashion network. Again, young women wearing kimono, doing different events together. A lot, lots of this is online as well, um, driven through social media. And um, as you can see here, just really a very carefree and fun approach to the garment. Many of these young women, they also, you know, become designers and designing their own garments, which are often inspired by the Meiji and Taisho period, but also with some, some very modern 
contemporary influences. This, for example, is also a great um, brand. I'm going to try to wrap, wrap this up now. Um, modern antenna, you can also just see in the images they used to advertise the kimono, the poses are very different to what you usually see um, in the more conservative style. So how, you know, you move in a kimono is kind of visually, um, yeah, represented differently here. This again, you know, this retro kimono uh, style then also became throughout the 2010s, became really a, one of the most um, popular styles for young women for the coming of age day, besides the more conservative style. So the 2010s really, you know, from the subcultural development also came more into kimono um, companies and industries and big brands making um, this the style also for coming of age kimono. This is a great topic as well, but I can only, um, you know, um, just touch on it. There's also really a big debate going on for kimono as a sustainable garment, um, also size free, because again, it has a different relationship to the body and also gender neutrality. Um, I think I could do a whole nother um, lecture on this, but yeah, just so you know, some of the debates going on right now. And uh, my last point, if you're ever in London, um, please uh, go visit Furukiyo Kimono Vintage, which is run by Sonue. You can see her on the left here. She has a very great shop of vintage kimono. She sources everything from Japan and she's very knowledgeable. So you can go by, have a chat with her. Um, and she's always happy to tell you about different designs and different prints. And we've also collaborated and hopefully will do again in the future. So with that, I leave you with that. Um, here's some sources, just, um, you know, if you want to read a bit more, um, just so you have some, some hints here. And with that, I'm going to end and say thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Carolyn. It was uh, very, very interesting. Um, I'm not sure how emoji and various things work, but I'm, I'm clapping on behalf of everybody <laughs> at the very least. Um, so thank you for that wonderful presentation. I'm going to take chair's privilege, if I may, to ask a first question. Um, as I think you know, I'm quite interested in various aspects related to symbolism. And one of the things I've come interested in recently in relation to Japan are sort of things like Camon and the symbols. And you pointed out the ones being used for the shops. What aspects of symbolism actually come into kimono? I mean, I didn't see, there were one or two examples maybe where you could see a family crest appearing, or maybe it was the logo of a company where the Kabuki actor is. But is the particular meaning, I mean, when somebody even today goes to buy a kimono, do they just go, they want the pretty one? Or is there some understanding that certain animals represent something and anything along those lines? Yes, so interesting question, which again, I think could fill a whole uh, lecture. And I know you're going to do a symposium, I think, on this topic soon as well in Cardiff. Um, um, maybe to keep the answer uh, short, an interesting finding from my, which I write about in my PhD thesis as well. I actually, before doing this research, I didn't know so much about kimono. Um, but there is a great symbolism behind the pattern and, for example, the flowers. Flowers often get become used. And, of course, there's this whole language of flowers and they're related to the season as well, but also have some other meanings, um, same as we know as well. So I did a lot of great research into these, you know, um, the different patterns. And, of course, this is very important for the more conservative um, section of kimono wearers when do you wear which pattern what does it symbolize to which event but then I you know when I interviewed young women for the coming of age day and I often asked them to describe the kimono to me they wore for the coming of age day um, and I was oh what pattern was it and usually they said yeah flowers and then I ask what kind of flowers and they don't know then they kind of go more ah like Japanese flowers, although it's more of a guess always. So this is interesting because there's definitely kind of a, um, 
there is a recognition of a certain kind of traditional flower pattern but further than that most young people are not you know this is probably the same everywhere but they're not able to tell you the symbolism behind it and um, they are kind of aware of some cultural codes but um yeah this is a quite quite interesting topic as well so in theory there is a lot of symbolism but of course in praxis and when people use it it gets um lost as well so that's yeah Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to read out some of the questions which our participants have been posting. Um, so I've got one here from Joy Hendry um, saying that I, I like the way ladies hold up the front of their kimono, uh, something Japanese dancers do when dancing Scottish country dancing, unlike most of us Scots. Um, did women often do that in Edo, Japan, or were they just protecting the kimono, um, them, the kimono from the muddy ground? Yes, thank you, Joy. Um, great question. So the dance is doing Scottish country dancing. I'm not familiar with Scottish country dancing. Um, I do think there is an element of protecting them from the ground. Um, you can also see this in the shoe design because um, I'm not an expert on shoes, but the Japanese um, geta shoes, they are, they have, they're quite like a platform heel. And I think this is originally related to to kind of, you know, not get the hem of your kimono muddy. On the other hand, there was a lot of because there was definitely a time period when the flowing, at least in the ukiyo-e prints, you can see that the hem is very long and always kind of dragging behind. Um, but yeah, then probably when they were outside, they must have held them up um, the hem to not, not get it too dirty um but yeah that's all i can say to that excellent thank you for that uh next one is from uh david krauser who asks are kimono and yukata still a popular garment at japanese summer festivals uh yes definitely i mean um i of course i haven't been to japan uh, since before covid and i'm not sure now with COVID, how summer festivals have been affected, but definitely when I did my research in 2018, um, it became even more and more popular. Um, a lot of that industry, the rental um, yukata industry is reliant on tourism, not just foreign tourism though, also Japanese tourism, but um, it would be interesting to look at, um, you know, how it has developed. But in general, it's still very much popular, not just for women, also for men, um, you know, to where this is also a recent, more recent development that also young men are more interested in um, kimono. Can I follow up on that? Because I mean, I, I mean, yes, it's been a struggle for all of us, obviously, to get to Japan at times. And in Japan, there have been restrictions, though not as severe as we've seen, say, in the UK. But obviously, I mean, at the moment, we're talking at a time when um, the sakura is out in many places in Japan, and it's very easy to see videos and images on Instagram, which is great for researchers at one level. We can see what's going on and watching the sumo tournament last week. It was interesting sort of looking at the audience, let alone the rikishi, in terms of what people were wearing and what they were doing and so on. Is the whole Instagram side of things actually maybe something which is further promoting and encouraging people to wear kimono? Do you think that the world has become that much more visual again? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, um, you know, the kind of kimono retro community, which I, or subculture, which I talked a bit about, even during COVID, they did a lot of activities um, through Instagram. So they did kind of challenges, you know, people couldn't go out so much were kind of um, told to stay at home, but they did still did a lot of challenges. For example, let's post um, an outfit for a day when you would go to see, um, I don't know, to go to the park with your date or something. So even through COVID, Instagram was really for the kimono community very important. Um, and definitely, I agree um, that um, Instagram and other visual social media, kimono being such a visual garment as well. And so, um, you know, with interesting patterns, it really also helped in the last decade um, to 
to make it more popular. Excellent. Um, a question here from uh, Saskia Doolan, I'm hoping I'm getting the pronunciation there correctly. Um, what kind of trend do you see emerging that could define the 2020s in kimono? Um, first of all, hi, Saskia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for, for tuning in. I uh, love the question. I already have a theory and I think it's already starting because we have a lot of um, lace kimono um, coming in now and there's a quite um, popular magazine, um, you know, when we look at young people in their 20s called uh, Lamu. La this is kind of the new, I would say, trend setting magazines and it's kind of, this is very, um, this goes very deep. Um, there's a new well, there's a fa popular fashion style called Liu Gata K and um, Jilai K, which is a bit like a bit punk, a bit gothic, but also a lot of pastel colors and cute. Um, and I think this is kind of will be the defining uh, trend for the 2020s, um, which is kind of the retro style is really that was the 2010s but i think this more late and kind of subdued colors a bit more neutral colors um that's what i would say excellent thank you i think we've got a question which follows on very nicely from that uh, from another yamaguchi so we've got sheffield university represented over two or three different decades in terms of PhDs, I think, here. Um, <laughs> thank you for the excellent talk. Have you looked much into the trends of mixing Western clothing with Japanese clothing in more modern times? For example, I often see young people in Kyoto, where Ellen is based, wearing the kimono jackets, coats over a regular Western dress like T-shirt and jeans. Is it a growing trend or is it really only a subculture fashion at this point? Yeah, thank you. Um, interesting question, because I feel like this kimono jacket um trend kind of is maybe more coming from europe or the states and is now kind of getting to japan so again really a dialogue taking place here um so i can also say from my own um experience i have some kimono jackets again i would have loved to wear one today but i don't have them with me um and they're very easy garments to incorporate for you know um, non-Japanese who you know for us there's also maybe a bit of a awareness of cultural appropriation you know it's a bit of a difficult topic um, wearing a full kimono outfit again is seen as quite challenging but I think there's lots of brands um, now who are really or shops promoting um, kimono in Europe and also the states and often people start with a kimono jacket um, because it's very very easy to incorporate and I think it's kind of coming over a bit to Japan now as well. But again, kind of, you know, this conversation taking place there as well. Excellent. We do have some additional questions and quite a few people have made points as well. Um, but unfortunately, we're getting up against uh, our time limit now. So, Karen, perhaps I can encourage you to have a look through those and um, maybe answer them in another method. Um, if I can again... Thank you for your presentation. And I should have said also at the beginning, uh, thank you to the Japan Foundation London office, um, who are the sponsors of this event. If I can finish off with just a little bit of additional information for people. Um, let me try and make sure I get the right slides. Uh, so um, first of all, actually details on our next uh, seminar. I've also put the link in the chat. Uh, Dr. Chiharu Chujo from the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies will be speaking on consenting and transgressing, exploring contemporary Japanese love songs through a gender critical lens. That's on Wednesday, the 26th of April. I put a link in the chat. I sincerely hope that Kat will also be joining the online lecture. I think it'd be marvelous. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I've also put a link in the chat and it's up here on the screen for the uh, link to where you can find the recordings of all of our um, lecture series and so on. Um, that's what it looks like or one of the, from a time ago, um, if you do access that. Um, so that is all. Thank you very much for attending. Everybody will be receiving an email um, asking for some feedback on the webinar. So please do fill that in if you could. It's very helpful. But again, thank you everybody for attending um, and enjoy the rest of your day.
Yeah, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, also please, you know, you can write me an email and I'm happy to discuss further. Thank you.